Remember when people used to say, come on, he's only a kid. It seems like it was at least a generation ago that we said that about youngsters who got into trouble with the law. Well, today, we don't hear that very much anymore. What we do hear are repeated calls for the courts to get tough, for younger offenders to be treated as adults. Last year, in Los Angeles, murder was at an all-time high. More than 2,300 people were killed. One quarter of them were killed by teenagers. That's just one of the statistics we learned while we were filming in Los Angeles for a report we called Murder Teenage Style. It didn't have to be Los Angeles. We could have found much the same thing in any one of a hundred cities in this country. Cities where people have stopped saying, come on, he's only a kid. Why? This is why. My name is Tommy. I'm here for an attempted murder. I'm 15 years old, living in L.A. My name is Ricardo, and I'm in here for second degree murder, and I'm 15. My name is Walter. And I'm in here for armed robbery and personal use of a firearm when I'm 15 years old. There are almost 200 million guns in this country, and they are so easy to get that kids, the one segment of the population that is gun controlled, are now using guns at will. September 1980, Los Angeles, two in the afternoon at the Arco Mini Market. What you are about to see is a murder. It was filmed by the security camera in plain view behind the cashier. It began with a chance encounter with this woman, who was to later testify at the trial that she recognized the murderers from high school. This record of the indiscriminate murder of the cashier, even as he handed over the money, is brutal evidence of a trend. Crimes with guns are increasing, random violence is increasing, and the criminals are getting younger. Tonight, a profile of the most violent and disturbing generation that this country has ever spawned. Their toys are guns. Their playground is urban America. The best thing that you can do to help us as students is to report to your fifth period class to carry on your day as you normally do. The students at this Los Angeles high school had a hard time going back to class. One of their own, 16-year-old Michael Carr, was dead, shot on campus between classes. So he was my boyfriend one time. I used to go with him. I just came up to the school and Tracy told me he was dead. Outside the school, police were acting fast. Two hours after the shooting, they arrested the suspects, all of them 17 years old. It was one of 203 gun incidents in the L.A. Unified School District within a year. Hey, I tell you this much. I got a buddy that's 15 years old, all right? And most of the fellas out here know him. Our first of the year, he was involved in a murder. The murder took place at... T. Rogers is a former gang member who is now a social worker in this neighborhood. They walked him into an alley, okay? In the alley, they set him on fire. He rolled around, he put himself out. They beat him up again, they set him on fire. They put a carpet over him. Took a 45 automatic and put his knee on his back and shot him in the back of the head twice. The boy, 15 years old. Yeah, but tell me one thing. Who are the they? Is it him? Was it me? It don't have to be it's here. It's, 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 but, but then why are they, the who are you talking yeah. about? You know what is the point? Because all of us being the same people, all of us being the same situation, all of us being the same block, all of us all about the same thing. And each and each and any one of us out here can do the same thing. That's true. If I came at, up at you and threatened your life, you mean to tell me that you wouldn't kill me first? Yeah, but that ain't no bed around here. This is the jungle. The jungle creed said the strong must feed on any prey at hand. I was branded a beast and I sat at the feast before I was a man. You did it ten years ago without a gun. You need a gun today. No, I ain't got. Let me no tell you why. Wasn't that bad ten years ago? Seriously. Yeah. This is gonna be a war one day. <laughs> it's gonna be a serious war. And everybody figure if I got my gun, I ain't gonna go out by myself. Even when people go to their cars, 
When people go to their cars, they say, well, if this person gonna rob me, you know, uh, uh, I'm gonna get him before he get me. That's why people carry their gun for self-defense. Well, that's defense. different than a war, No, but that's man. just that's like saying a war gonna come. No, no I guarantee you, <laughs> if when you get off work and you get in whatever car you got, and you put your little revival in your pocket, and one of these little gangsters walk up to you and say, oh, this is Jack, and get your wallet and start running, you allowed to bust five rounds in it. And that's the truth. So everybody gets a gun to figure, hey, I got the same equal rights as another man. This is my baby brother right here. This is my protection right here. That's why everybody needs a gun. One of the things that, I, that keeps me going is to know that I'm not the only mother that's going through it, nor is he the only father that's going through it, because every day that you hear that some kid was killed, and it seems to be that age, 15, 16 years old. I mean, it's sad that a kid can't live past 16. Armed robberies and homicides have more than doubled in L.A. in 10 years, to a large degree because of gangs. Sheriff's deputies Jerry Kauna and Ron Herps are on the gang detail. There are over 30,000 gang members in L.A. They are a kind of teenage army, and most of them have guns. He took a gun on campus? Okay, and how did they find this gun? Okay, after school he pulled on some kid. Was he arrested on the gun incident? Does he have a history of arrest? I'm gonna pick it up just a little bit, uh, Aaron. That's good, hold it right there. I look straight in the lens here. And I work the gang detail, my name is Kaono. K-A-O-N-O. Are you more cautious today when you approach a kid than, than you were when you, yes. when you first started as police officer? We're placed in a situation on a burglary in progress. We got there, in fact, the burglary was in progress, and investigating that burglary, I became confronted by a juvenile. And when he jumped out, he yelled, gotcha. And uh, when my partner was screaming off to the right, he'd just run to the front of the yard. He's got a gun, he's got a gun. I can tell you, I remember the first muzzle flash. I remember fire come out of my gun. And I recall, even today, what I only remember what I thought I only shot once. In fact, I emptied my revolver. As it turned out, when I finally caught up to him, rolled him over, he was 17 years old, and then, Jesus, the policeman, he said, my God, he was, you know, he's only a kid. Got in the house, and really wasn't concerned with age. He was fighting me just like any man. Back in 1974, is, I had a different impression, a different expectation from kids. You know, they, kids aren't gonna pull guns on you. That's not gonna happen, yet it was happening. At the time of our filming, the city of Los Angeles was prosecuting four 13-year-olds for murder. It's still just a small minority that commits most juvenile crime, but every police officer we talk to says that those crimes are more violent and more unpredictable. Every year, juvenile courts sentence 20% of young criminals to some form of detention. It costs about $25,000 a year to lock a kid up. It's cheaper to send a kid to Harvard. In California, the most serious punishment for a juvenile is to be sent to the CYA, the California Youth Authority. In 1980, the average time served here for murder was two and a half years. 50% of these kids will be locked up again within two years for new crimes or parole violations. But the feeling is that while they are here, at least they're off the streets. Everybody else lay it out on silence. I started practicing juvenile law in 1969. The kinds of crimes that we dealt with then were drug-related crimes, uh, drug abuse, some burglaries, auto thefts, delinquent crimes. There were batteries on each other or assaults. A couple of times knives were used. You didn't have guns. Are, well, clearly had guns, but they weren't used by juveniles. Today, kids seem to carry guns to school like we used to carry cigarettes. We were at a party one day, and we were all drinking in the front yard, and another rival gang came by and shot him in the back of the head, shot my other homeboy in the arm. The one that got shot back in the head just died instantly. Then uh, a couple of days later, you know, we went and fought again. With the, uh, that, that same gang, then uh, we shot three of their homeboys, killed them. You know, it didn't upset nobody. We just got all mad, you know. We just went down there and killed a couple of their homeboys. 
The director of mental health for the juvenile hall says these kids are scarred by rage that comes from envy of what others have and they don't. And he says they're also affected by hours of watching television, hours of seeing what is to them a world beyond their reach in both programs and commercials, a world apart from their daily lives. In talking to me and producer Arena Posner, it became apparent that they envy status, they envy power, they envy fame, and they strike back. I shot this dude in the head for no reason, you know. I just knocked on this door and I, I didn't want to, you know, go inside and righteous, you know, be physical with him, you know. So, like, I knocked on the door and they ran. And I spotted it, you know, he was going for a gun. So, you know, when he came back to the door, I just let off on him. I'm in here first degree murder. I'm the age of 17. We were just driving down the street, and we saw some guy up in a blue pickup truck. And we looked at him, and he said, so we, we, we didn't know who it was. And we, we weren't too sure, but we figured we knew who it was. So we drove up next to him, and we looked. Still couldn't, we weren't too sure. We just looked over, and, he, and I looked over at him, and he said, so go ahead. So I just pointed the gun out of the car, just shot him. It was underneath the ear. I shot him underneath the ear. So when you rob people, sometimes someone won't try, they try to fight you and don't want to get up their stuff, then you have to shoot them. Do you come from a family that's real poor? Mm-mm. What's your family like? I got a good family. We middle class. I get everything I want. But so it was in the summertime. I didn't have nothing to do. Then homeboy thought about robbing somebody, get some extra money. See, my mother, she bought me what I want, but I don't, I don't really like to ask her to buy me stuff. So then, like, I wanted to buy a motorcycle, and I didn't have no money. I didn't feel like asking my mother to buy it for me. So I said, I was going to go get my own money. And went out, we started robbing people, taking their money. Does it seem strange to you that that surprises me so much? Yeah. Because, see, it happens every day. People get shot every day. People get robbed every day. People house get broken every day. No, it's, it's not that hard to kill somebody. What do you mean it's not hard? It, it, it's not hard. It takes a little kid to pull the trigger of a gun. Yeah, but it's not just a, the trigger, man. It's here. Yeah. It, it don't affect my head. You know, I don't get all paranoid. You know, that's how I grew up. You know, I just don't get paranoid about things. I, I like the feel of a gun. <laughs> How long are you in here for? Uh, a year. What did you do? Robbery, armed robbery. What's that tattoo on your face? It's supposed to be a teardrop. What does that mean? Time. What do you mean? You know, if you did time before in, in jail. Does that make you sort of a big man? <laughs> when you first get it, it does. But now it doesn't. Now it doesn't. Well, it makes him look like he's a fool. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to take it, you know. It's really hard. When you first do it, it don't seem like you have no feeling. When as time roll along, it'll start coming to you. And when it start coming to you, it start coming to you hard. You know, maybe when you're in front of your little friends and stuff, and y'all talk about it, and you laughing. But once you get down by yourself, you know, into a room someplace, and you get to thinking about it, you know. It will bring, I don't know about for these other men, other gentlemen in here. I know for me, you know, I thought about my little crime and other little things I have done, you know. And it kind of, you know, broke down hard to me. It broke it down hard. I don't know, because since I've been here, because I've been here probably about two and a half years, and just thought of doing it again. It's not only doing the time, it's just thinking about, uh, like, the victim you know, the victim's parents, you know, people that he knew, you know, what they think now, you know, and just what they went through, because, you know, there he is, and now he's dead, and, then, you know, what they must think of me. And then you just, all you can do is hope that you got yourself together. Because it's, you can't really say, nobody can say that they're going to make it on the outs. All they can do is just try to do their best. In spite of what most of you might think about kids who commit violent crimes, 
The law says they're still kids. That's why we obscure their identities. There are now more than 226 million people in this country, and there are almost 200 million guns. No one knows how many of them are illegal. And to the law enforcement people we talk to, those illegal guns are a symptom of something worse, like discovering you have termites. The pile of sawdust they leave outside is not the main problem. It's just a sign of more serious damage deep within the structure. Crimes of violence are on the rise, and gangs of armed kids are a growing menace in some 300 towns and cities. But perhaps what is even more disturbing is that we don't seem to know what to do about it.